of Glass webinar, which is being recorded. Um, so very pleased to, to welcome you here. We have two absolute stars uh, to share uh, their expertise and engaging comments uh, with us. I can see the numbers are, are coming in here. Um, Finding Nathan, how science discovered Cath Canterbury Cathedral's oldest stained glass. Obviously, I've had a look behind the scenes. We're in for a really good uh, webinar here um, tonight. So my name, if we could move on to the slides so I can remember what my name is. Uh, there it is. My name is David Stringer Lamar. Um, I have the honor of being the upper warden uh, here at uh, the Woodsville Company of Glaciers. And this is what we're going to, going to be going through uh, this evening, so you know the direction of travel. So welcome from the Master Glazier. We'll then be hearing uh, first from Leone and then from Professor Ian. You'll then get a chance to uh, put your questions and answers to them. And please, if we can have lots of difficult questions, I know that's what they would really like. Nothing too easy for them. They've already asked me um, to, to convey that uh, message. Um, and then, of course, some closing uh, remarks uh, from us. Now you'll see we have the um, chat down there and thank you people who are already using it. Do say hello to us. Let us know where you're from. Let us know what you do. Um, let us know your comments um, about uh, the, the webinar as we go through. Um, and this reminds me that we have two polls um, to, to bring up here that we would like you to, to respond to. So if I can ask uh, the very learned clerk to bring up the polls, please. So the first one, location, where are you attending from? And there you go, it says a single choice. So UK, EU, United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, or elsewhere. So if you would like to answer that one, please, and you have 20 seconds. It's always fun to hear where people are from. And of course, you've got the chat function there. So do please let us know exactly where you are, are from. So we have here, I'm going to go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Thank you very much. If you wouldn't mind ending that, please. Thank you. And you'll see me looking away. I've got another screen here. It's not that I'm disinterested at all in, in what we're all doing here this evening. Could you possibly show us the results of that one if we have? Oh, there we are. Look at that. So ah, we have some uh, people here from the, uh, the EU, which is excellent. And goodness me, look at that. So we have 5% uh, from the United States or, or Canada. So welcome to everybody. Indeed, do let us know uh, where you are. UK, EU, beaming around the world, as it were. Next poll, your interest in this webinar. I, I quite enjoy these bits, as you can see. So if you can give us the next poll, please. Uh, Clark, there we are. Are you a glazier? What does it say? Are you a member of the Worshipful Company of Glaziers and Painters of Glass, or indeed the Company of Nurses? But in this particular one, we probably are, but you never know. Um, so yes, I am a glazier. Oh, it's, it seems to have gone away. Could we have the poll back? Has it been taken away by, by the nurses? I, I can't see it on my other screen. Could we relaunch that one? Well, we could do it at the end if that, that, that's an issue, not a problem. Um, anyway, we'll get that bit there. So you can let us know in the in the chat, if you wouldn't mind, if you're a glazier or if you're not a glazier, uh, you remember some other organization, let us know, because it's all about being friendly here. Um, or if you're simply passing by and you saw this on the screen and you thought you'd uh, log into it, all are indeed very, very welcome uh, in uh, to join us. Now you'll see down there the Q&A function. So if you do have a question, um, please do put it in there. Do not bury it in the chat because we won't be uh, monitoring that. And also there is the possibility of, um, of uh, voting for the, the, the questions. So the more popular are, they actually go uh, higher up um, so I can see them more easily. So chat facility, we've done the poll, we might come back to one and questions, voting for your favorites. Okay, we're on time, we're there. It's now my great uh, privilege and honor to invite the illustrious, the Master Glazier, Phil Forty, to address us. Master. Uh, thank you, David. Um, well, good evening to all of you and welcome to the second Glaziers uh, webinar of 2022. Um, tonight, we're bringing together two very experienced contributors 
uh, Leonie Seliger, uh, who's both an artist, Freeman of our company, and is director of stained glass restoration at Canterbury Cathedral. Leonie knows an awful lot about this place, having worked in the stained glass department in various roles for nearly 30 years now. She will be paired up with, later in the talk, Professor Ian Freeston uh, from the Institute of Archaeology, part of University College London. Uh, Ian's speciality is in ceramics and particularly has an interest in glass and has worked in cooperation uh, with many diverse projects. Uh, tonight sees us understand how bringing art and science together has led us to understand quite a bit more about these windows at Canterbury. So I will now sit back and learn with the rest of you. Thank you very much both. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Master. Uh, now, there are lots of messages coming into the chat, um, and I can see that there's space for global, so you can um, please select message to everybody. So thank you very much for the ones I'm getting through. Very pleased to welcome uh, the Master of the Laundress here. Um, people are telling me Bristol, Dorset, Swansea, East Anglia, um, many people in here. So please do keep um, that going. And of course, questions and answer there. I would now like to formally invite uh, Leone to address us. Leone, over to you, please. Thank you, David. Thank you, Master, for inviting us to speak to you tonight. Um, it's a great honor, as always, uh, to have such an illustrious audience. Now, uh, our talk is about how to date stained glass. There's a bit of a problem here because we can't carbon date stained glass. It is an inorganic material, it has no tree rings that you can count. So how do you go about it? There are several different ways and I'm going to talk about three of them and then pass over to Ian for the fourth and the, you know, the clincher, if you will. Now, what you're looking at here is the famous waterworks plan of Canterbury Cathedral as it was before the current building. So you're looking at Canterbury Cathedral at some point around 1130, 1150. We don't quite know exactly when. Um, and uh, the building had actually burned down in 1067 right after the conquest and had to be rebuilt, you know, by in the new Norman style, which is very convenient. If you've just had a conquest, you bring the new style over. Um, and it was um, a very well loved building. But when it burned in uh, 1067, the new choir that was built um, was really quite extraordinary. From 1090 onwards, the, uh, the Priory decided to extend the choir eastwards and make the building basically twice the size it was before. And it was known as Prior Conrad's glorious choir. And we have a little bit of documentary evidence of what that was like. That's the first uh, way of dating stained glass, if you have documentary evidence. The only thing we know about Prior Conrad's glorious choir was that it is what was richly decorated, full of works of art. And William of Malmesbury tells us that there was nothing in England to touch the light of its stained glass windows. So it was glazed, obviously with stained glass. Liz, would you like to burn down Canterbury Cathedral now? Thank you. <laughs> there we go. That happened again, it burnt again. And that happened only two years after the murder of Thomas Beckett. And with it went all the artwork, all that famous artwork was burnt. The only things that remained, next slide please, Liz, um, were things that were underground in the crypt. And if you come to Canterbury Cathedral, I highly recommend you make a trip down into um, St. Gabriel's Chapel where you can see these absolutely stunning wall paintings which date to between 1130 to 1160 and also fantastic carvings. We're going to come back to these wall paintings in a little bit. So remember that they are in St. Gabriel's Chapel in the crypt of the cathedral. Next slide. 
Well, once the site was cleared after that disastrous fire in 1174, what was left was a hollow tooth. And the cathedral, or rather the priory, um, decided not to raise the whole thing and start from fresh, but rather to build into that shell and build higher and better and more modern. So on the left, you see the hollow tooth. On the right, you see the current building with the areas that were added later, added after 1176, blanked out. So you get a sense of how much Romanesque work there still is standing above ground. Next slide, please. And what was added on top of this hollow tooth was um, the first vaulted church in England um, Gothic architecture made a, an appearance. This was the work of William of Sens, and he added this huge, for its time, huge clerestory full of very tall, for their time, stained glass windows. Um, next slide, please. Now, if we look at that choir from above, this is what I call the exploded view of Canterbury Cathedral stained glass. We're looking only at the clerestory windows. Now, another way of dating stained glass is by following the building history. Think about it. If you build a building, you need scaffolding. And we know that they started the rebuilding of the church from the west, which is on your left. And they moved steadily bay by bay over to the right, which is the east. And they took the scaffolding with them because obviously it's very expensive stuff. If you can uh, build bay by bay and move in sections, you, you save money. But of course, as soon as the scaffolding is gone, you can't install the stained glass windows. So it is very reasonable to say within the first two years, they had moved from the west to the, to the crossing. Um, and within those two or three years, they would have glazed the windows. And then as we move into the transept, we are going into the 1180 um, period. Now, we know that the entire choir, everything that is encircled in red on the left, all of that was in use at Easter 1180. And it is very, very likely that the stained glass, these windows were all in at that point. They were continuing to build towards the east. So everything that is in the smaller rectangle here um, was still a building site. How do you use a church that has a building site? Well, you put a partition in and literally where the red vertical line in the center is, that's where the partition was. It was a big wooden partition. And we know because Gervais of Canterbury um, wrote an account of the rebuilding of the church. We know that wooden partition was glazed with stained glass windows, but we don't know what they showed. Now, at some point between 1190 and 1213, um, well, at some point, the, the period between 1190 and 1213 was characterized by huge upheavals um, between the monks and the archbishop. And not much building work was going on at that time. So there was a hiatus. And only around 1213, the monks came back with the glaziers to glaze the upper part of the Trinity Chapel. So everything in the smaller rectangle dates bet to between 1213 and 1220. Next slide, please. And that allows us to see the stylistic change. And here we now come from building history, uh, we're bringing in style. In the early part, you have monumental tall figures surrounded by rectangular borders. Um, and next slide, please. In the later part, you suddenly have a totally different approach to filling a window with figures. Ornament is taking over. The figures are becoming part of the ornament almost. They're, they're tiny compared to the earlier, late Romanesque, early Gothic figures. So we have building history and style combining to give us a sense of what's early, what's late here. Next slide, please. Um, unfortunately, things didn't settle down really for Canterbury Cathedral. So we had iconoclasm in the 
well, first of all, a reformation in the 16th century. And then um, we had iconoclasm in the 17th century. And so of the originally 86 ancestors of Christ figures, these tall figures that circled the choir and the Trinity Chapel, half had disappeared by the 18th century. And what the cathedral decided to do was to relocate these remaining figures, almost every one of the remaining figures into the two largest window in, windows in the cathedral, which had been entirely denuded of their stained glass uh, by the iconoclasts. And so around the end of the 18th century, the Great South Window was given what must be the world's greatest patchwork quilt in stained glass. And um, they were literally just um, choosing things for their decorative value, I think. Next slide, please. So here is what the window looks like now. And next, please, Liz. Um, we're just looking at the figures of the ancestors of Christ. Um, I should have mentioned that we start with God, we originally started with God the Father creating Adam and then worked our way all the way around the cathedral, going all the way east and then coming back to the west until we end with the Virgin Mary and Christ. And of course they have disappeared. Um, so next slide, please. So what I mean with uh, they were choosing things for the decorative value was Originally, the figures were seated father above son or son above father. Um, and that rhythm, that logic was disrupted by the uh, reintroduction of the glass into a new window. So we now have the early monumental Romanesque, early Gothic figures um, as a sort of a frame around, next slide, please. The more ornamental, smaller, uh, early uh, mid-Gothic figures here, um, as you can see, um, outlined in the window. Um, next slide, please. What is remarkable is how they treated this precious stained glass. They literally hacked bits off to fit these, um, these figures in between the much narrower openings uh, between the mullions in, this, uh, in the stonework. And they also added bits so that you had equally sized large rectangular panels. And that'll come into uh, play later when Ian looks at the chemical composition of the different parts of these, these panels. Next, please. In the west window, we have a similar situation where at least the bottom half of the window consists of glass that is much earlier than the stonework it sits in. And in the very center at the bottom is the next, please. Next slide, please, thank you. Is Adam Delving. Now he, we know, was in place by 1176 because the scaffolding was moving on. So this is our very earliest stained glass window in Canterbury Cathedral. Adam very fittingly being the first man, also being the first stained glass window, also we thought. But is he? That's the big question. Next, please. The question was asked by um, Madeleine Cavanus, who is a um, very, very uh, eminent art historian specializing in stained glass and Gothic art. She wrote her, uh, MA, uh, her PhD thesis at Canterbury Cathedral. She basically catalogued the entirety of the stained glass, the medieval stained glass in the building. And she used building history mainly to date the ancestors of Christ windows. Um, however, as she was talking about windows, figures in the eastern part, in the later part, there are several figures where she's hedging her bets. You can feel her being uneasy about dating them so late in the 13th century. And she says things like, well, you know, they have an antiquing feel. Maybe the artists were harking back to an earlier style to give gravitas to these figures or something. And um, really, when you read it, you don't quite believe she believes uh, her own words. 
Only six, year, uh, six years later, she then published an article in which she proposed that these figures, that some of the figures in the later part of the cathedral are actually much older and that they are survivors from before the fire. Next, please. And these are three candidates for early glass in the West Window. Um, and uh, you can see, I think, that they are much stiffer than the grand Romanesque figures that we, sh we saw before. Next, please. And what Kavanagh does in her article now, rather than what she did in the catalog where she was arguing on building history, she now argues purely on style which was not fashionable at the time. It was actually very much frowned upon. But she compares the, one of the figures here, Abias, with one of the figures from the wall paintings in uh, St. Gabriel's Chapel. And I think you'll agree, they could be by the same artist. And we know that those wall paintings predate the fire by quite a long stretch. Next, please. Uh, look at those faces. Uh, they are so similar. And I love that, that Norman moustache of the gentleman on the right here. Next, please. Particularly if you compare it to the original face of Abias, because what you see in the stained glass now is actually a copy and not a particularly good one. Um, the original head of Abia, by the way, is lost. So if anybody has that hanging in their window, can we please have it back? Thank you. Next one, please. And another figure in the West Window, she compares to this um, uh, image of January from the St. Albans Psalter, which also dates to about 1130. Very, very frontal, very stylized, and not at all animated like the later Gothic figures at all. Now, next slide, please. The trouble is that stained glass windows tend to be in a building and um, not in a place where you can get at them easily. And um, in the Great South window, the two figures that she identified as potentially early are very, very high up, and there is no way you can get at them normally. Uh, next slide, please. Until the stonework of the entire window starts to crumble and you have to evacuate the stained glass at high speed because it's in danger of being uh, destroyed by a collapsing window. At this point, we then got uh, in touch with uh, Ian Freestone asking him whether he would like to have a look at our stained glass. And I'm going to pass over to Ian now for the next part of the story. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Leonie, for that. Tr truly fascinating. I, I like these aspects of, you know, is Adam the first, I think you said 1176, uh, and this hacking off of glass uh, to make it fit into the openings. And then I hope uh, everybody heard it. If you happen to have the, the head of Abias, could you actually get in touch and maybe we can uh, get that back, back in place? And then, of course, you set it up nicely. So crumbling masonry allows the detectives to, to move in. So Ian, Professor Ian, over to you, sir. Thank you, David. Um, yes, well, thank you, Leonie. That was reminded me of um, how privileged I am to work on the glass from that wonderful building. Um, now, let's just set the scene about medieval glass and how it was made. Um, medieval glass, as you know, is, is mainly composed of sand, but in order to make the sand melt, you have to add something to it to bring down the melting temperature. And what we know is that in the medieval period, they added the ash from burning wood or fern um, to the sand. And you can see someone on the left hand side there, um, he's harvesting bracken to, to, be, to be burnt, to make ash, uh, to mix with sand to melt glass. And this can bring the melting temperature of the glass down from around 1700, which is about the highest you get in modern steel foundries, to 1150 or so, which is um, uh, achievable in a fairly simple wood-fired furnace, like the one you see on the right. Next slide, please. Now, what we know about the composition of glass um, is related 
to these raw materials, the sand and the ash. Um, one of our students, Laura Adlington, who's been really leading this project, I'm just here as a, like been an advisor to her through much of this. Um, she has identified um, three regions of Europe which made medieval glass and they can be distinguished on the basis of the chemical composition. Um, she took about 1300 published analyses across Europe uh, over the past 40 or 50 years to do this. And so we know in principle um, that the composition of glass relates to the time and place when it was produced. And this is key to what we can do with the Canterbury uh, windows. Next slide, please. So for example, we've looked at glass from the Great East Window of York Minster. Now, when the Great East Window was dismantled as part of the York Minster rebuild project to restore the, the east end of the cathedral um, due to the crumbling stonework in part, um, the glass was deleaded. The lead was removed from around the glass pieces and that allowed us to take tiny splinters of the glass for analysis. And what we could show was that the colored glass in the window came from the Rhineland not from France as, as, as we'd expected, whereas the, the white glass, the color, colorless glass in the window uh, came from Staffordshire. And in fact, we can be fairly confident that it came from a small group of uh, glass houses near Rugeley in Staffordshire on the basis of the chemical composition. And that's great, but unfortunately, well, I guess fortunately, we can't take samples from the ancestor windows in cathedral in, in Canterbury because they are still mounted. Next slide, please. So how do we analyze a window in situ, which is what we need to do. And in fact, really to extend the work we've done in York in any way, we're gonna have to start looking at windows in situ. And there are all sorts of problems. As we know, stained glass windows weather and you get a surface layer which is a different composition from what's underneath it. Any sort of instrument we point at it, air gets in the way and absorbs the signal. We can't put things flat against the glass usually because the leads get in the way and interfere with our machine. And also um, the machines are usually made of metal and we don't want to push metal, hard metal against an early stained glass window, they're fragile. And so what this means is that most elements in the glass, we can't measure accurately very easily. Next slide, please, Liz. So we have two solutions to this. And the first one we came to was to analyze the elements that are the most reliable ones. And there are a few trace elements which occur in the glass, strontium, rubidium, and zirconium. Um, strontium and rubidium give us a kind of fingerprint for the ash and zirconium gives us a fingerprint for the sand. And that's because these are heavy trace elements and their x-rays pass through the air and through the surface layers on the glass. And the second solution, it should have a number two on it, I'm sorry about that, something went a bit wrong with the slide, is that we take one of these handheld x-ray analyzers and they're, they're a bit like a large heavy hair dryer, and they're widely used in industry to, um, to monitor the composition of metal being produced or to search for ores in the ground, for example, or to look at traces in soils to see what sort of uh, nutrients are there. We took one of these machines and we modeled a kind of nose for it which Laura, Laura, the student involved, calls a window lizer. And she fixed the, uh, the nose to the machine and that allows us to get in between the leads on the glass and it keeps the machine at a constant angle and a constant distance. So we get much better measurements. And also it's made of a, a light uh, plastic material so it doesn't do any unintentional damage to the glass. Next one, please. So here's Laura. Um, there she is analyzing one of the ancestor windows from Canterbury. Um, they were dismounted when the window was uh, restored and taken into the 
to the workshop. So we were able to analyze those with a light, a light, a light behind them. Um, and this allows us to analyze tens of pieces of glass in a day, up to 100 if you're working really hard. And she was able to analyze three of the ancestor windows in the, in the conservation studio um, while, while she did the work. Next slide, please. And so these are the windows we analyzed. At the bottom there, you see Methuselah. He's from the, um, the, the 1170s and 1180s phase of the building, um, which, which uh, Leonie has described. And um, he's, he's our representative of early glass. And then we also analyzed Ezekias. You can see him at the top, at the top left. And he's, um, he fits very nicely into the 1213 to 1220 phase. And in addition, we have Nathan. Now, Nathan, who you see on the right, is one of the windows which uh, Madeleine Cavaness felt was possibly dated to be before the fire. So although he's in the 1213 to 1220 uh, position at, at these days, um, we think that he or originated um, possibly before the fire, and that's what we wanted to test. So we figured that if Nathan was early, his glass would be more like Methuselah than, it, than Ezekias with whom he was uh, positioned. Next one, please. So these are our results um, in, in terms of our chemical, chemical components. And we can see a real difference between Ezekias and Methuselah type glass. Methuselah, the early glass we call type A, and Ezekias we call type B. And you can see that on the left-hand side there, the ash that was used to make the Methuselah glass is much lower in strontium and rubidium than the glasses you find in the Ezekias window. And similarly, there's a difference in um, zirconium on the right. So we've got these two types of glass. So let's look at the individual panels. Next slide, please. So here is Methuselah, the early panel. And what you can see is that most of Methuselah is made up of his glass type A, but there are other bits of glass there. For example, up in the frame at the top, there's some type B glass, which has probably been recycled when the window was moved into the um, Great South window. Um, there's uh, a small piece of modern soda glass up there in, on the left-hand side, and there are some early repairs all around the edge where you'd expect them. So that all makes sense to us. And so the, the type A glass fits with being the early glass used to make Methuselah. Next slide, please. So here's Ezekias, the late glass. Ezekias is, is, um, is made of what we call type B glass, um, and we, we characterize this as being later. And what you see is that his body and his head is made of type B. But again, the frame around the edge has been um, rebuilt from older glass and a mixture of different types of glass, in fact, um, when, the, when, the, when Ezekias was placed in the south window in the 1790s. Next one, please. And finally, we come to Nathan. Now, Nathan is an interesting one because his head, as you can see, is probably not original. It's a modern soda glass, so it's a, a modern copy of his original head. There's type B glass, the later glass uh, in the frame around the outside, but Nathan's body is made of the type A blue glass, the early glass, the same glass as Methuselah. And so Nathan seems to be an earlier type of glass. And this is consistent with Cavanus's suggestion that Nathan was a survivor of the 1174 fire. If we go on to the next slide. So what we would say is that instead of being up there with Ezekias, next, Nathan belongs down there with Methuselah, or perhaps even earlier. We can't, um, we haven't got any glass 
that we know for sure is from 11.30 to 11.60. What we know is that Nathan is early, earlier than the 12.13 to 12.20 construction period in which he, he occurred. So we think that this shows that Madeleine Cabanes's theory is fairly sound at the moment, as far as we can test it, and that Nathan is early. Next slide, please. And so we would put Nathan sometime before 1174, perhaps as early as the, uh, uh, sorry, as early as the 1150s or 1160s. Um, we have to test our hypotheses further. For example, we've got two panels which show this difference in, in time, the AB compositional chronology, and we need to test that some more. The issue is that the other ancestor windows are not easily accessible, as Lenny pointed out. They're up the top of the, uh, in the Great South window, but we are analyzing other windows in Canterbury now to confirm this, we're using funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And hopefully, we're going to also be analysing some windows from churches in France to, to show the, the effect. And finally, um, we need to know, if we're dating it in this way, why this difference in composition occurs. It's quite important because we're always going to have, we can't, well, we're always going to have a limited amount of evidence in that we can't analyse everything. So we have to understand what's going on before we can uh, finally uh, confirm the dating of Nathan. So uh, next one, please. That's, that's me uh, finished. Thanks very much for listening. And thank you, David. Excellent. Splendid. Uh, and beautiful segue uh, with Leonie's uh, work there as well. Um, we have four questions already um, in the Q&A. Should you have some more, do put them in there. Um, also, you have the voting function, so I'll be picking the ones off, off from the top there. But before we do do that, I've got a, a few questions of my own because you've stimulated my, my interest at no end um, in this one. Now, it, it seems to me Canterbury and other... Um, places of worship or possessors of stained glass will no doubt have other secrets um, to potentially discover. Um, how, how much of a focus, uh, Leone, if I may ask you, does, does Canterbury Cathedral have within its limitations about finding out, if I can put it, the, the true story, the true history of, of the building? Well, I, I think you've put your, your finger on the sore spot within its limitations. <laughs> Um, we would love to do so much research. There is so much to do, so much to find out, and it it helps us tell the story and and engage with people so much better. Um, we've had quite a few really exciting uh, discoveries over the last few years, which have made national and international news. So we'd love to do more of that, and there is ample space for it. Um, it is just in these times um, quite difficult to fund it out of our own pocket. In fact, we can't. We always need to go out to find funding. But if anybody feels enthused um, and, uh, you know, interested in joining us on this um, discovery, then please get in touch. Uh, th thank you very much uh, indeed for that response. And I'm, I'm just remember when we we're in the green room, as it would be where we were before, you mentioned that there is a new book out and what was it called? The First Miracle Window? Could you just mention that to us, please? Yes, it's called The First Miracle Window, Beckett's Earliest Pilgrims in Canterbury Stained Glass. Now, the light has, has really left me. I don't know whether you can even um, see me. Yeah, uh, we can see you very clear. And, and there is the book, um, and it's beautifully illustrated, and it tells um, another story of discovery, uh, which we did research with um, Rachel Koopmans from York University in Toronto, and we're hoping to continue that research over the next coming years. It's going to be on sale in the cathedral shop and online from Friday onwards. So get your copy. It's only six ninety nine. Thank you very much <laughs> uh, you. <laughs> indeed. Um, and Ian, uh, my, the question that came to me is, um, you know, very much interested in scientific um, discovery. Now, clearly, there's been some progress, innovation on your ability um, to understand these windows. But what's the time frame 
yeah, the, this usual question, how long has this innovation taken to get to where we are now? Has it been fast or has it been stop, start, stop, start? What is that trajectory where we've seen, I'm just looking at my notes here. What did you call it? The window lizer or the yeah. window lizer? I mean, well, the, what's it um, like, the innovation? We started work on stained glass, my group, in 2008. Okay. Um, I think the window lizer, um, we did a lot of work on small, on tiny splinters, tiny splinters from uh, stained glass in store for the first five years or so, and from, from the dismantled York window. And then we developed the window lizer, I think in around probably 2016, 2017, that sort of time. Um, Laura went to Canterbury probably in 2018, I think, Leonie, you'll probably correct me on that. Um, to do the analysis and then we finally got around to understanding it in around 2020 and now we're trying to spread the word all right Th thank you very much for the insight right let's go over so there's actually more more questions piling in as normally happens so let's see how we can go so the first one off the top here uh from roger uh interesting they built west to east from 1176 as i believe most churches were built from east to west why might this have happened? Well, um, I, I omitted to say that the nave of the cathedral was actually not affected by the choir. So we had a Norman nave standing and then the hollow tooth um, adding of, of a Conrad's a glorious choir um, towards the east. And essentially you start building from the sound part into the void, if you will. And that's the reason why they started in the west moving east. Thank you very much uh, indeed. And it might be already there with the second question uh, from James. It would make most sense to build the altar chancel area first and expand the nave to the west. <laughs> yeah, but that's exactly the reason. The other thing is, of course, they um, they were already, I mean, they, were, they were they had just witnessed the murder in the cathedral. We're four years after the murder in the cathedral. And they are thinking about how do we actually present our new saint to the world? So they're, they're having plans for an enlarged Trinity Chapel to house the shrine eventually of the, of the saint. But they, they need to have a, a solid grounding in the choir first. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Now we have a tantalizing question here, which essentially says, do you know what you're talking about? But obviously in a good challenging way. So Adam's head face look, looks much more modern in artistic style and technique. Why is this panel thought to be so old? Well, um, it's, it's literally just uh, the glazing history, the building history combining. We know that they started in the first bay on the west with God the Father creating Adam and then Adam delving. So we know from building history, that's where it should be. Um, stylistically, the early glass, the 1170s glass is really exciting because I think it is so modern. And there is no doubt that that is early medieval glass but it has that excitement of something, you know, modern, um, which you can't find in pastiche. And also in later uh, Gothic glass, the, um, the sculptural quality isn't there anymore. It all flattens out a bit. It becomes decorative rather than sculptural. Great, thank, thank you very much uh, indeed for that one. Thank you, Rebecca, for that question. So Elizabeth, why what is some of the glass left why uh, is some of the glass left clear unidentified in the color coding of the glass panels ah oh, that's quite uh, straightforward they're the pieces we didn't analyze um, we didn't have time to do everything um, we sent uh, laura down to canterbury with the instrument and said okay Here's three nights, bed and breakfast, more or less. That's what we can afford. It's the usual limitation. So fit it in. And that's what she did. So we didn't do everything. Um, some pieces you can't get to anyway. They're just too small. Um, so, so, so we tried to analyze a fairly constant number from each panel. Great. Right, thank you very much uh, for that, and Elizabeth. So we have Ruth. Does the language of the words names in the windows help you date, identify the maker? And the date, and also a sub question what languages are there? English, French, Latin, perhaps, or were the words added later by the Victorians? 
really good question. Thank you for that. Um, they are in Latin, but they have idiosyncratic uh, spellings because, you know, there isn't really a standardized spelling at the time, I think. Uh, so they are medieval, they're not Victorian later editions. They were meant to be part of the original design, but they have been repaired and replaced and messed about with. So, um, I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rely on the authenticity of every last piece in there. Great, uh, thank you. Um, Suzanne, past master Susan Galloway of the Glaciers, can you date and or analyze glass paint, I say painting by scientific method in the same way as well? If only really, um, yeah, um, in principle, yes. In practice, it's very difficult because the glass paint is rich in lead and that interferes with the signals the machine's getting. Lead's a very good absorber of x-rays. You know, you have a lead apron when you're doing x-rays in hospital and so on. So that limits what we can do. do. Um, people are looking at this and I think we'll get some way, um, but probably, you know, there'll be phases of different sorts of composition, maybe two or 300 years long, that sort of thing, but it won't be fine detail. I'm, I'm pretty confident of that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what do we have here? Um, I missed one out there. So from Nick, if you had enough samples, could you use this technique to create a reference map glass production across Europe, as you can with bone or hair analysis? Um, yes, in principle, yes. The issue is um, cost and obtaining enough samples, because as, as we've already commented, most of the glasses in churches or cathedrals, you need to get up there, get to the window and analyze it, or you need, you need, you need preferably to produce a really robust map, you'd need samples. Um, we've analysed stuff from a number of regions of Europe, but we just don't have enough to get a good coverage. Thank you. In terms of, just a question there, in terms of the minimum amount you would need of these shavings or samples, etc., can it be very small? You know, like you've seen in the films, etc., you know, it's just a little bit and it gives away the, the identity of Nathan or whatever it might be, or has it got to be quite a big chunk of glass? The pieces we deal with are from underneath the leads, they're about splinters of about two or three millimetres long and perhaps a millimetre or two wide, that, that sort of level. Now, what is going to come through in the next five years is probably a system where you can take a laser and take a tiny surface from the sample with the laser, take it back to the lab and analyse it. That's that people are working on that. That will be that will even allow us to sample windows in situ but it's going to be expensive, um, that, that I can predict. Certainly um, some of the analyses we do, um, a point on a graph cost, can cost 500 pounds, a frozen. Can, can I just- No, no, you're still there, you're still there. Okay. Can, can I just come in on that as well? Um, not taking samples of this tiny size may seem, um, you know, being holier than the Pope, more Catholic than the Pope, but um, it's a principle in conservation that if you don't absolutely have to interfere with the object, you don't. And what it does, if, <laughs> if I may be so bold, it does push the scientists to invent new things. Yes. <laughs> so there you are. <laughs> Our reluctance to interfere with the object actually creates new avenues for, uh, for sampling, non-destructive sampling. Excellent. So, so you are actually saying no, you do not touch my windows led to the direct uh, development of the window laser. So, so that's good. You heard it yes. here first. Well, well done, <laughs> indeed. Uh, so we have Ruth. Oh, no, it says I can't see where to vote. Um, uh, you tick on the, the top right um, box and hope it says where it is. Uh, Dan, uh, excuse me, Dan uh, uh, Leone, once the glass types have been identified with the window laser just mentioned, is it possible with experience to differentiate them by eye alone? Hi, Dan. Um, you know, <laughs> no, no, it's not. And that is what is so exciting about this. We are discovering things about our glass that we simply couldn't know before. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm really, really pleased that we have this, this new technique to help us 
know something that was unknowable before. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, as a point there, uh, Professor Ian, when do you think Windalizer 2 will be coming along? The improver, you don't have to answer that unless you want to. <laughs> um, well, we're, we're trying to improve it all the time. <laughs> um, it's, the, the principle is, this is like fingerprinting. The more lines you have in the fingerprint and um, uh, the, the sharper the lines, the better the match with the criminal. So at the moment, we have three elements. If we had 20 elements, it would look a lot better, um, if, you, if you can see what I'm driving at there. So, so it's, gonna be, it's going to be five or 10 years, I think, before anything significantly um, better comes along. Yeah. Right. And, and no doubt you're in church you know, with, with all, all the other experts around the world as well. I mean, is the UK at the forefront, the middle ground behind? I mean, who, who's leading this or, or well, you know? At, at the moment, we're leading this uh, non-destructive, non-invasive analysis with a handheld instrument with windows in situ. Um, some people are quite sceptical about it elsewhere. Um, and so we're going to convince them. It's, uh, yeah. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I, now, I have one here. I think it's particularly for you, Leonie. You can help us out with this. What was the title of the book that you mentioned oh. earlier? We may have a customer. <laughs> well, wonderful. Uh, the title of the book is The First Miracle Window, Beckett's uh, Earliest Pilgrims in Canterbury Stained Glass, and it's by Rachel Koopmans of York University with a little bit by me. Excellent. Could you possibly hold up the cover so people could see it the, the visually? There it is. I can see that on my screen. Thank you very much, Leonie. Uh, thank you, Polly, for your, your question. We look forward to you buying at least 10 copies. Right, what other next one we have here uh, from Rebecca again. Is there a connection between areas of bracken covered countryside and glass making? Yeah, yes, there Excellent. is. Well, that was short. <laughs> yeah, Cannock Chase is where a lot of the glass was made. Uh, lots and lots of, of bracken and wood. Um, and so these, these, these are known as forest glass houses. They were making glass in the forests um, and then. Um, sending the glass uh, to the to the cities and towns so yes um uh, there is a connection excellent uh, thank you very much indeed uh i leonie i think this is one for you here um so brian says as a dentist i am fascinated by leonie's reference to the hollow tooth who originated this example which normally causes pain where's the term from I suspect I may have been using a Germanism there. Don't you use that in English, a hollow tooth? Uh, well, Ian, would you mind answering that one? Do we use that in English? Uh, sometimes, I guess, yeah. Okay. Very diplomatic. I'll go I with would, sometimes. I would imagine, yes. <laughs> yeah, very British. <laughs> uh, but I would imagine that, uh, that seeing the burnt out remnants of the glorious choir would have been quite painful, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, a question there about etymology. And we have one now from the, the, the Henri Chaplin of the Glaciers, who states the extraordinary political turmoil of the period of the glass, Henry II, Richard, John. Did this have any influence on the subjects and creations of the window? Oh, my goodness. That is a, a fantastic question, which deserves about two hours worth of answers. Um, there are, you have 60 seconds. <laughs> there are many, many theories from different people um, about how that is reflected in the choices in the stained glass, mostly basically the cathedral the priory asserting its um, holier than thou status over this terribly murderous king, but at the same time also the king trying to ingratiate himself with the, with the priory and, and um, taking over Thomas Beckett as his saint. So there is there is lots to say about that. And I'm not the right person to, to talk about it, I'm afraid. Excellent. Well, well, thank you very much for taking them. That's most appreciated. We have ran out of time. I estimate, just chopping it down, you, you got through about 23 questions there. So thank oh. you both ever so much um, uh, for that. There's been some per, some direct ones to be here, but there's no chance of getting through all those. So, so clearly, clearly an excellent presentation from you both. I'd now like to uh, invite the Master Glazier to address us. Master. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, well, what a fascinating introduction to the way in which bringing together art and science then manages to uh, reveal these secrets. The detective work is indeed remarkable. And also, I've noticed 
uh, points out that using recycled glass is not a 21st century activity, but has been going on for an awful long time. Thank you very much for all of you for uh, contributing to this. Thank you also to David for uh, running this whole thing from his area and our learned clerk Liz, who did a lot of the work in the background and was changing slides on request. Um, thank you so much. It's now my pleasure to do a few parish notices, if I may, of things to come in the future. Uh, hopefully uh, you will have seen these on the screen before, uh, but the one I'd like to draw your attention to especially is the next webinar on the 19th of April. This was not previously advertised, we have put it in, um, but it is one of our liverymen, Oksana Kondratieva, who is herself Ukrainian. And she's going to be presenting a webinar entitled Ukrainian Stained Glass. Very generously, she has given her time and all the proceeds from that webinar will be sent directly to the Disasters Emergency Committee. So this is going for humanitarian aid. I would urge you all to sign up as early as possible because once you've signed up and made your contribution, we will be in a position to forward that to the Disasters Emergency Committee. So that is the 19th of April, Ukrainian stained glass, the next webinar from the company. Thank you all for your contribution. Thank you, uh, Master, very, very much uh, indeed. Um, may I now invite uh, the clerk um, to address us? Hello, everyone, and my apologies. There must have been a bit of a glitch there because we just had a complete power loss temporarily, and I'm afraid I can't get the slides back again. But um, what I was going to say, uh, at this point was simply that we are always open to new members if anyone might be interested in joining the Glaziers and uh, our website has has got a link for membership applications people can get in touch with me at clark at worshipfulglaziers.com to ask any questions we admit members five times a year and there's always lots going on. We're a very friendly company. We have feeds on Twitter and on Facebook and also on LinkedIn. So you can keep up to date with what is happening on any of those. Excellent. Thank you very much uh, for, for that indeed. So as you said there, we're an open company. We're very engaging. We have members from literally all over the world. And now, of course, we have this Zoom uh, facility. We're able to admit uh, members, so you certainly do not have to be based here uh, in the United uh, Kingdom. In fact, I can see one of our, our excellent uh, livery, livery men from the USA is joining us on, on the call. Um, so there's lots of ways of actually hearing about what we do. And of course, the City of London is a splendid place and we're part of that whole fraternity. And tonight, of course, you've heard two uh, experts engaging, uh, presenting, sharing, their knowledge with us. So there's lots of that. And obviously, as the master has, uh, has mentioned, there are lots of engaging events as well. And certainly the information is out about Oksana's uh, next webinar that I'm very much uh, looking forward to. So in the old days, as it were, so for all, it's good night for me. It's good night from him. It's good night from the Glazers team. Thank you, Leonie. Thank you, Professor Ian. Thank you, Master. And of course, thank you all for joining us and asking all the questions. Good night. <laughs>